Thanks, Magda, very much. Uh, well done for sticking with it. There's a lot of material, and it's all pretty grim. So well done for keeping going. Because the fact of the matter is, isn't it, that as we read the Bible tonight, well, it's real. It's real, it's grim, and it's gritty, and it reminds us of the world that we live in. Indeed, some of the material in tonight's passages reminds me of one of the hardest news stories of the last couple of years that we've had to listen to. I don't know if you remember the story of the 279 girls who were kidnapped in Nigeria by the fundamentalist Islamic terrorist group Boko Haram. 279 girls kidnapped in the middle of the night, taken to who knows where to face all kinds of horrors. But the hardest thing about that story is that even though it's dropped out of the news and we don't hear about it very often, it's far from resolved. And there is indeed the very real possibility that that story will never be resolved. Those girls will never be found and justice will never be served and that wrong will never be righted. And you think about that story and it should produce in you an anger, a righteous anger at the deep iniquity that is behind it. And in that sense, the story of the girls from Nigeria is not unlike some of the stories we've read about tonight. Stories of deep, unresolved unrighteousness. But whereas the story of the 279 girls is set in Nigeria, on the edge of Islamic territory, the stories of 2 Samuel 13 and 14 are set in the heart of David's kingdom, the kingdom of God's own king. And that, in a sense, is the horror of 2 Samuel 13 and 14, that things could get quite as bad as they do. But by the time we get to these chapters, that simply is the character of David's kingdom. That's how bad things have got. And that, I think, is the burden of this section of 2 Samuel, 2 Samuel chapters 9 to 20. It's meant to show us just how bad things can get in the kingdom of a human king. We know that, I think, by way of a, a compare and contrast exercise. You see, the book of 2 Samuel is, well, I've said this already, divided into three parts. Uh, three parts with two blocks of material that act as, as breaks to tell us that the material is moving on. And we're going to do a, a quick compare and contrast exercise to understand what it is the author wants us to understand from these different sections. So turn back to 2 Samuel chapter 8, first of all. I'm going to read this little block of material that comes at the end of 2 Samuel chapter 8, uh, a list of the great and good of society in David's kingdom in that moment. And as I read it, I just want you to make a mental note of what's there, okay? Just a mental note of what's there. Chapter 8, verse 15. So David reigned over all Israel, and David administered justice and equity to all his people. Joab, the son of Zeruiah, was over the army, and Jehoshaphat, the son of Ahilud, was recorder. And Zadok, the son of Ahitub, was, and Ahimelech, the son of Abiathar, were priests, and Sariah was secretary. And Benaiah, the son of Jehoiada, was over the Cherethites and the Pelethites, and David's sons were priests. Pretty straight stuff. Now... Turn to 2 Samuel chapter 20. Where in verses 23 to 26 we get the next break. The next block of material that breaks this material up. Keep a finger in chapter 8. And let me read to you verses 23 to 26. And the question you're asking as I read these verses is what's missing that was there before? Okay, what's missing that was there before? And don't worry about the changes of names. Verse 23. Now Joab was in command of all the army of Israel, and Benaiah the son of Jehoiada was in command of the Cherethites and the Pelethites, and Adoram was in charge of the forced labor, and Jehoshaphat the son of Ahilud was the recorder, and Shiva was secretary, and Zadok and Abiathar were priests, and Ira the Jairite was also David's priest. Now, if you want, take a moment, flick back and forwards. Ask yourself the question, what's there in chapter 8 that's not there in chapter 20? The answer, of course, is verse 15 of chapter 8. 
Verse 15 of chapter 8, David reigned over all Israel and David administered justice and equity to all his people. You see, that's the nature of David's kingdom at the end of chapter 8. He's the great king, God's great king, ruling over God's kingdom with justice and equity. Everything is all right with the world. But by the end of chapter 20, there's no justice and no equity. You see, something terrible happens between chapter 9 and chapter 20 of 2 Samuel. And the terrible initial act, of course, is what we saw last week. The moment David commits adultery with Bathsheba and then plans and carries out the murder of Uriah. And from that moment on in the story, David goes from being a great king to being a compromised and cursed king. At chapter 11, we read it last week, it was like trudging through a quagmire as we saw David's terrible adultery and David's terrible murder. And in those moments, the pattern was then set for what David's kingdom would be like from that moment on. And that pattern is what is repeated in chapter 13 as we see Amnon's, as it were, adultery and Absalom's murder. And because of what David has done in chapter 11, in his adultery and in his murder, from that moment on, he is compromised as a king. He's unable, as it were, to rule with equity. He's unable to deliver justice because he's a hypocrite. He's done all of those things himself. And as a consequence, we're seeing the fallout of it as his kingdom spirals out of his control, down and down into a more and more desperate state of affairs. But 2 Samuel chapters 9 to 20 are not just the results of cause and effects. They are that, but they're much more. Because, of course, David is not just a compromised king, he's also a cursed king. Uh, you remember, and I've printed it on your sheet there, chapter 12, verse 10. God's verdict on King David as a result of his sin. He says, the sword shall never depart from your house. The sword shall never depart from your house. And now in chapter 13 and 14 and in the weeks to come, chapters 15 to 20, we're going to see exactly that enacted on the house of David. And indeed, that's the story of human history from this point on. The sword shall never depart from your house. And so if chapters 11 and 12 were like a, a quagmire that we had to trudge through, chapter 13 is like an open sewer that we have to wade through, through the raw sewage of human sin, starting devastatingly with the rape of Tamar, as injustice is ignored. You see, there's much in this chapter, in chapter 13 in the first half, that is meant, I think, to remind us of David's sin with Bathsheba as his son follows in his footsteps, a chip off the old block. Uh, you remember David, we're told, took Bathsheba. Well, now verse uh, 11. Uh, when Tamar brought them near to Amnon to eat, he took hold of her and said to her, come, lie with me, my sister. And just as David in chapter 11 exerted his power and authority to manipulate affairs so that he could have his wicked way with Bathsheba, so Amnon uses his strength in a much more raw and capricious way. Verse 14, uh, he would not listen to her and being stronger than she, he violated her and lay with her. He's a chip off the old block following in his father's footsteps. But if much in these verses is meant to remind us of David's sin with Bathsheba, Everything in these verses is designed to show us the horrors of sin. And I know for many in this room, as you read through these verses, they will be difficult verses to read, raw in their quality, reminding you of events in the past. And if that is you tonight, let me encourage you, please do find someone to talk to, maybe after the service, maybe in the coming weeks. Because these verses are here for us to remind us of the realities of the world that we live in, not to encourage us to sweep them under the carpet and pretend that they don't exist. And we need to be a church, therefore, that is there for each other in these moments, able to help each other, able to bring the gospel to bear on these realities. Because sexual abuse is always horrific, whether we see it on the pages of the scriptures or experience it in real life. 
We see it, don't we, in the tragedy of Tamar's experience. Uh, she is diligent. She is obedient. Uh, she is kind. She is caring. She's wise. And even under the most extreme pressure from her half-brother, she's concerned for what's right as she commands him and instructs him and implores him to do the right thing. And yet, by the end of the story, she has been used and abused, a product of the destructive power of sex and of lust. And if in your gut, as you read this story, you don't feel an anger welling up, you haven't really got the point of the story. This is deep unrighteousness. And then there's Amnon himself, a man who at the beginning of the story speaks of unrequited love. But as the story goes on, it becomes obvious it's unrequited lust. Unrequited lust that causes him, causes him to deceive and to scheme and to harden his conscious, conscience and in the end to rape his half-sister. And he discovers in that act that unbridled lust does not ever produce love, but rather hate. Verse 14, he would not listen to her, and being stronger than she, he violated her and lay with her. Then Amnon hated her with very great hatred, so that the hatred with which he hated her was greater than the love with which he loved her. And verse 13 couldn't be lower in its estimation of Amnon. He is qualified now as one of the outrageous fools in Israel. Now these verses teach us many stories. They teach us of the destructive power of generational sin passed from the father to the son. They teach us of the destructive power of lust that is unchecked. They teach us of the destructive power of the abuse of strength. They teach us of the wickedness of a worldview that re rewards strength in this life with virgins to abuse in the next. Now in every way they warn us and the warnings couldn't be clearer. But the sobering reality of these verses, I think, in chapter 13, is that nothing is done. Nothing is done about Amnon's sin and Tamar's rape. Verse 21, here is the king who is meant to deliver justice and equity. When David heard of all of these things, he was very angry. He was very angry. Of course, he was very angry. He's a father. What father wouldn't be angry in hearing about this? But as he hears about all of this, and nothing is held back from him, apparently, he knows all of the details, he heard of all of these things, he does nothing. Of course, David is not just any father. David is the king of Israel. He's the one who's meant to deliver equity and justice. And yet, we're told in verse 23, for two full years, he does nothing. Impotent now as a king, compromised and cursed. It's a pretty desperate picture, and it just gets worse as the chapter goes on, as we move into the murder of Amnon, injustice that is unjustly avenged. You see, just as Amnon's crime has overtones of David's sordid affair with Bathsheba, so Absalom's crime has overtones of David's conniving murder of Uriah. He's a chip off the old block, following in his father's footsteps. If Amnon is repeating the sexual misdemeanors of his father, Absalom is repeating the murderous misdemeanors of his father. And just as the story uh, of Amnon and Absalom reminds us of the story of David and Uriah, so too the story of Amnon and Absalom is meant in many ways to remind us of the story of Amnon and Tamar just moments before. These stories are meant to be considered together, tied together by the author, by the repetition of events as they unfold. You see, again, David is manipulated by one of his children, underlining almost the political impotence of David at this moment. Verse 24 of chapter 13. Absalom came to the king and said, Behold, your servant has sheep shearers. Please let the king and his servants go with your servants. But the king said to Absalom, No, my son, let us not all go, lest we be burdensome to you. He pressed him, but he would not go, but gave him his blessing. 
Then Absalom said, and this I suspect is what he's been pushing for all along, if not, please let my brother Amnon go with us. And the king said to him with a hint of suspicion, why should he go with you? But Absalom pressed him until he let Amnon and all the king's sons go with him. Who knows exactly what David should have done in this moment, but he's been played. He suspected all was not right, but he capitulated and he lets Absalom carry on. Again, David is manipulated and again, a horrific crime is carried out. Premeditated, cold-blooded murder. And even if at this moment in the story we think to ourselves, well, that is what Amnon deserved. He had it coming to him. Absalom was not the man to deliver it. Now, only God's king is in a position to deliver this kind of justice, not a power-grabbing pretender to the throne that Absalom will turn out to be. Again, David is manipulated. Again, a horrific crime ensues. And again, again, there is great lament and the tearing of clothes. Verse 31, this time it's David himself. Then the king arose and, like Tamar before him, tore his garments and lay on the earth. But for all his lament and all of his despair, again, David does nothing. David does nothing. You see, three times, and the author labors the point, three times we're told that Absalom fled. Verse 34, verse 37, and verse 38. And the repetition, I think, simply highlights the absence of response from David. He fled, he fled, he fled. Did David pursue? No. Did David send anyone to pursue? No. He's the king who's meant to deliver equity and justice, and yet Absalom is allowed to just slip away as if nothing has happened. Verse 38. Absalom fled and went to Geshur and was there for three years. Two years pass and David does nothing about Amnon and Tamar. Three years pass and David does nothing about Absalom and Amnon. And the pattern is repeating. Increasingly, you see, we've got a portrait across the course of chapter 13 of a king who is compromised and conflicted. And you almost feel sorry for him. You see, he's meant to be the king who delivers justice. And yet because of his own hypocrisy, because of his own failure, he's unable to do that. And of course, these are his sons following in his footsteps. You can imagine the conflict in his heart as he sees it all playing out and is himself impotent to do anything about it. The lesson is clear. A leader whose private life is in a mess can never lead with complete integrity, whether that's in the church or in government or in the wider world generally. Now, in David's kingdom, in David's compromised kingdom, the values of Hannah's programmatic prayer from the beginning of 1 Samuel are turned on their heads. Uh, in that programmatic prayer from the beginning of 1 Samuel, we're told that those who find themselves needy and on the ash heap, they're raised up. But here is Tamar, covered in ash, no one doing anything to help her cause. And in Hannah's programmatic prayer from the beginning of 1 Samuel, we're told that the wicked are cut off and left in darkness. But here are the wicked in broad daylight doing whatever they want. Now in David's compromised kingdom, the values of Hannah's prayer are totally turned on their heads because this is a king who cannot deliver justice and equity anymore. And the tension just carries on into chapter 14 with the return of Absalom, as injustice is tolerated. You see, like Nathan in chapter 12, you remember Nathan who turned up moments after David's sordid uh, sins from chapter 11? This woman from Tekoa turns up with a story for David. But the description that we're given of her in verse two should begin to, should begin to sound alarm bells. It sounds innocent enough when we read it ourselves, but in a wider context, it should make us nervous. Verse two, Joab sent to Tekoa and brought from there a wise woman. A wise woman, now that sounds pretty positive, doesn't it? But if you remember the way the word wise was used previously, it should make us nervous. You probably won't remember it because of the translation from chapter 13, verse three. See, the word that's used to describe this woman, wise, is previously used of our old friend, 
Jonadab. You see the end of verse three of chapter 13? Jonadab was a very crafty man. It's the same word, very crafty here is translated as wise in chapter 14. And so all of a sudden, as we read about her being wise, there's a more dubious quality to it. Are we meant to associate her with Jonadab and what he's like? Who knows? And where Nathan's story, as he told it in chapter 12, had a a scalpel-like precision that was meant to needle right to the heart of David's conscience and a righteous intent behind it, this woman's story, as she tells it across the early verses of chapter 14, has a it has an ambiguous quality to it and a dubious intent. She starts by tugging on the heartstrings of King David. She tells this moving story of two sons in conflict with each other, one of whom in the heat of the fight strikes out and kills the other one. And of course, as David listens into this, you know what's going on in his heart as he thinks about two sons at war with each other, one striking the other one down. And as she then applies this story to David, she appeals not just to his his heartstrings, but to his social conscience. Verse 13, and the woman said, why then have you planned such a thing against the people of God? For in giving this decision, the king convicts himself in as much as the king does not bring his banished one home again. David, don't you know the effects of your decision on the people of God, on the kingdom of God? Because, of course, let's not forget Absalom, despite his sin, is still the next in line to the throne. And as he languishes in exile in Geshur, the fate of the people of God is on the line. And so this wise woman from Tekoa appeals to the social conscience of the king. And then finally, she flatters the king, verse 17. At your servant thoughts, the word of my Lord the King will set me at rest. For my Lord the King is like the angel of God to discern good and evil. And we know that that is palpably not the case. We've just seen chapter 13. David is morally compromised. He cannot discern good from evil anymore. And that sentence at the end of verse 17 is a bittersweet reminder of better times. The Lord your God be with you. We're not really sure that's the case anymore. And there's a fundamental dishonesty at the heart of the story that this woman tells. You see, when Nathan tells his story to David, there's an exact precision. The events line up exactly in a way that is meant to needle at David's conscience. But this story that this lady tells, well, it's the story of a slightly ambiguous manslaughter case. We're not entirely sure what the right outcome should be. But the story of Absalom and Amnon is a clear-cut case of cold-blooded, premeditated murder. There's no doubt what should be done. But this lady has told this story with an ambiguity in a way that is designed to get a yes in answer to the request of verse 11. And a king who's just should never answer yes to this request. Verse 11, then she said, "'Please let the king invoke the Lord your God, that the avenger of blood kill no more, and my son be not destroyed. The avenger of blood refers to bits of the Old Testament like Numbers 35 or Deuteronomy 19, where the law makes clear exactly how manslaughter cases should be dealt with and how murder cases should be dealt with. And in effect, what this woman from Decoa is saying, as she not only tells her story, but applies it to the case of Amnon and Absalom, she effectively says to the king, would you turn a blind eye to the sin of Absalom? Would you mind just sweeping it under the carpets and pretending it didn't happen and welcoming Absalom back into your kingdom? No atonement, no justice, just carry on as though it hadn't happened. And true to form, That's exactly what David does. Again and again, he capitulates and does nothing. And he invites, at Joab's request and at this woman's request, he invites Absalom home. And verse 28, does nothing. So Absalom lived for two full years in Jerusalem without coming into the king's presence. Two years He does nothing about the sin against Tamar. Three years, he does nothing about the sin of Absalom. Two years more, he does nothing about the sin of Absalom. 
There's no reconciliation. There's no atonement. There's no justice. He simply lives in Jerusalem at arm's length, everyone pretending it just never happened. And that now is life in David's kingdom. It's just the way of the world. Indeed, it's the way of the whole world. As this pattern is repeated again and again throughout history. You see, these chapters, chapters 13 and 14, are gritty. And they're real. But they reflect the world and the way it is. This is not ivory towers theology. This is the Bible telling it the way that it is. And it tells us it the way that it is because it wants us to understand the world that we live in. You see, these chapters are a bit like glasses that we're meant to put on to understand the world around us. You see, these chapters are telling us that as long as we live in a world ruled over by human kings with sin in their hearts, we will always live in a world that is characterized by injustice and unrighteousness. And there's a sense in which as people who live in 21st century London, we are living under the cover of a justice system that is built on Christian foundations and in many respects protects us from some of the grittier, reality, grittier realities of the world that we live in. And yet, as we know, many of us in this room will have been on the receiving end of injustices that will never be dealt with. And the story of global history around the world today and down through the ages is the story of unrighteousness, is the story of injustice, is the story of no atonement and no justice. And the reality check of these verses is helpful for us because it will stop us from putting any hope in human leaders to bring about the world we really long for and will keep us putting our hope in the one king who can. Because if we feel the weight of these chapters, and I hope we do feel the weight of these chapters, we need to remember that the book of 2 Samuel has set a trajectory for us. In the short term, it's a downward trajectory. The next few weeks are not going to get any better for us as we work through the rest of 2 Samuel. But from 2 Samuel chapter 7, we have a more optimistic trajectory. You remember 2 Samuel 7 where God promised... He promised a king who would sit on the throne forever. And that promise comes from a king characterized by 2 Samuel chapter 9 and 10, a king who is marked out by kindness, you remember, by chesed, by love. And in who, who in 2 Samuel chapter 10 demonstrates he's a king of justice and of righteousness. And if you bring all of those things together, the promise of a God who is loving and just and who has a king who will sit on the throne forever, and you have a more optimistic trajectory. You have a trajectory towards a king who will come one day, and when he comes, who will make atonement for sin. He won't just turn a blind eye. He won't just sweep it under the carpet and pretend it doesn't exist. But a king who rather will look at sin square in the eye and then take it on himself. A king who will die in our place. So the people who have sexual sin in their hearts and maybe even on their hands. So the people who have violent sin in their hearts and maybe on their hands can be forgiven and can come into his presence. And unlike Absalom, who has to live at a distance from the king, unable to come into the king's presence, can instead be like Mephibosheth from a few weeks ago, can come into his presence and dine at his table forever. Now, when the king comes, he'll make atonement. When the king came, he made atonement. Jesus Christ dying in our place for our sins so that we can come into his kingdom. And when he comes again, this king promises, as we've been thinking all evening, that he will establish a kingdom that will not be characterized anymore by unrighteousness, by iniquity, and by sin, but instead his kingdom when he comes will be a kingdom that will be characterized by perfect righteousness, and by pure judgments, and by eternal sinless, sinlessness. 
And such will be the perfection of the reign of this king in contrast to the imperfection of the reign of King David, that he will even be able to take away the scars and the pain and the bitterness of the past in this world. You see, these chapters are horrific. They're a dark backdrop. But they're meant to produce in us a longing, a hope for a better world, a better future, a better king. And the rest of the Bible is all about that king, about the moment when he comes to make atonement for sin, and about the moment when he will come to bring in a better world in fulfillment of the verse we're going to finish with, Revelation 21, verse 4. You see, this is the nature of the kingdom that the king of 2 Samuel chapter 7 will bring in. Let me read to you Revelation 21, verse 4, the great hope of 2 Samuel chapters 13 and 14. Here's the nature of the kingdom of the true king. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore, for the former things have passed away. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we look on the impotence of King David, the inaction of King David, the injustice of his kingdom at this moment, and we see so much of our world reflected in it, and it weighs heavy on our hearts. And so we thank you for the promise of King Jesus. We thank you that when he came, he was perfect in every way, and that his perfection has been given to us through his death on the cross and his glorious resurrection. We praise you that he reigns over all today and will come back one day to establish his kingdom fully and finally. And Father, we look forward to that day and we ask that you would speed its coming. We ask that he would come back to establish that perfect world, that you'd bring it in hastily and that you'd keep us looking forward to that day, whatever the darkness of our reality today. Keep us anticipating it and longing for it and looking forward to it. In Jesus' name, amen.